My name is Erin Reed, and I am the marketing manager for Polaris MEP. And this past year has seen so many things which are simply beyond the control of Rhode Island's manufacturers. But at the same time, even with a pandemic, right, without a pandemic, many companies struggle to maintain that control. Their employees aren't on the same page, the same problems keep popping up again and again, or there seems to be no accountability. So this webinar introduces a way to get and keep control, which is the business operating system. And today we've got our host, Phil Ward, who is Polaris MEP's project manager. And Phil is a project manager for Polaris MEP, which means that he is like the rest of us, working to help Rhode Island manufacturing companies improve their performance. Phil, do you wanna take it away? Great, thank you, Erin. Um, so for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with Polaris, Right. Our, we are a nonprofit. Our sole mission is to help small and medium sized Rhode Island manufacturers. Right. And we're going to help you grow, hopefully be more profitable. We're going to help you with uh, consulting services and hopefully hiring additional people. We are part of a national network, the MEP network. There's over 51 uh, different centers, one in each state, including Puerto Rico. And what the benefit there is, is it allows us to draw on all the resources nationally to, to help our local manufacturers. All right. So just like you, we are measured on key process indicators, right? And if we're not uh, being successful and impacting our clients successfully, and we're, we're not also growing ourselves, then we're in trouble. So we are measured just like you are. And right, our measurements, as you can see on this slide, are not only around economic impact, but also jobs retained or created, improved sales, right? And even though we had a tough time in 2020, I think like everyone did, um, we also were uh, successful in helping local businesses. And um, one of the things that I, I like to tout, if you look at the, the, the note on the right there, for every dollar you spend with Polaris or an MEP organization, on average, you get $13 in return, which is an unbelievable uh, investment, all right? So none of the outcomes that we've achieved in the last couple of years be possible. Um, when you're struggling, um, to get your man manufacturing business under control. And that's why we're here today, all right? So I'd like to introduce um, a friend of mine here, Don Smullen. He joins us today from one of our sister sites from DVR, DVIRC, which stands for the Delaware Valley Industrial Resource Center, right? He works with clients in the Philadelphia area in the development and implementation of strategic plans and succession plans. Don also guides executive teams through issues related to lean manufacturing transformations, productivity initiatives, and he helps strengthen skills in building strong collaborative employee teams, right? Don is a business leader with over 30 years of experience in engineering operations management, planning, procurement, and plant management. And, you know, Don, I was really excited when you offered to come here to Rhode Island to talk to our manufacturers about a business operating system, right? Because I consistently get companies that tell me that they don't have control over what's happening day to day. Many times they feel like things are just crazy. And there is a lack of people accountability, which they need to sustain their improvements, right? They, I always hear, I, I just can't get people to, to continue working on a certain area or working on a project. And I really believe that this presentation will help a bunch of our uh, clients, right? Kind of connect those dots and, and it should help everybody online. So with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to you. Okay, thanks, Phil. Thanks, and uh, nice, nice to be with everybody today. Uh, you know, Phil went over my background. Um, 
you know, basically 30 plus years in operations from engineering to ops management to general management. I've been with the MEP group in the greater Philly area here for three years. And I do the, the various strategy services that, that Phil talked about. Uh, but this one on operating system is close to my heart, right? I mean, I've had the opportunity in my career, work for a bunch of different companies, small, large, and really work for some uh, kind of some world-class operating systems. And it's a, it's a need I saw in our clients like we have here and like you have uh, you know, the MEP organizations all over the country, right? Because it is a core need. And, uh, and I developed this really just kind of to right-size it for the kind of clients uh, you know, that we have uh, in all of our MEP organizations. So let's, uh, let's dive in, right? What, what is a business operating system? Um, it's a playbook, right? It's, a, it's not abstract. It's actually your playbook that you use to run your business for you and your leadership team. Um, you know, what it does is it, it really sets expectations and if you're doing it right, it's setting those expectations for the team folk, for the team members every day, right? It, it gets everyone on the same page. It, it keeps people in sync. Um, you know, and if you're living with some level of frustration around, you know, these kind of topics, it, it means that, you know, something's missing. But, you know, it's, it really isn't nirvana. You know, you, you can put a system in, you know, that really pulls this together. You know, the, the mother of all operating systems is really TPS, right? The Toyota production system. And, and don't let the production system be misleading. It's, it's a system that really covers everything in the business from, from strategy right down to daily operations and, and production. And, and all the other systems you see, you see up here are really all offshoots in many ways from uh, TPS, from Toyota production system. You know, I had the opportunity to work at Danaher for, you know, for multiple years. And I thought I was a pretty good operations guy before I went to Danaher. But boy, did it, did it open my eyes, the strength of an operating system and how that can really add value, add, add value to an organization. And I know within, um, within the Polaris MEP that there's, uh, you know, several clients there that you know, Phil, you, you, you've worked with in order to put some elements of, uh, of an operating system. You know, now, Don, into, into I, I noticed these are all very large established uh, companies. Do you have to be a large established company to be able to have a, and utilize a business operating system? Right. A absolutely not. Right. Are you going to use the same type of system? As Toyota or Danaher, you know, no, you're not. But there's, I think, there's core elements that are that are really appropriate that need to be in every size company, and 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 kind of what I've done here with it, with with what we're going to talk about today <clears throat> is talk about those those three core elements. So, if you think about, yeah, but do I really need an operating system, right? Well. You know, take a look at some of the elements here, right? Which, which ones call out to you, right? Did, in the last couple of years, did you ever have a, a great year where, where top line was up 15%, but you were in the single digits as far as uh, net profits? You know, was, was that frustrating? Do you feel like, you're, you know, you're working too many hours? Do you feel like everyone comes to you for, you know, for the answers and you just kind of can't? kind of can't get, you feel like you can't get control. I think if you, if you start answering yes to some of these, to some of these questions, boy, there's some element, you know, there's some elements of an operating system miss, missing. So again, what, what we've tried to do here is right size the elements from an operating system for the, uh, for the clients in our, in our MEP. So, you know, I, I like to use the word structured and discipline, right? And it, it's an analogy to lean and CI, right? Because I think structure and discipline and standard work in all of our businesses, it, it helps us. So if you think about we're a, a less structured or a well-structured company, right? Think about our reoccurring issues unresolved. Is there a lack of personal accountability, right? Do you, do you use words like, why can't people just know what to, they should be doing, 
right? Are they unclear about the health of the business? Do they really know maybe your business is doing well or your business is struggling or certain products are doing well? Do you start new initiatives and they die? Are people meeting or not meeting with some of their direct reports? The flip side of that, in a well-structured business, right? Reoccurring issues do get resolved. They don't rear their ugly heads again. You know, people take personal accountability. They understand the health of the business. You know, when you put in new initiatives, boy, they, they are sustained. And people do meet with their, with their reports on a regular basis and stay in sync, right? Those are kind of the elements of a well-structured business. And what an operating system does is it, it provides that process to move, move you from left to right, right? From, from less structured to well-structured. So, you know, kind of listening and, and hearing from the folks that are on the call today, Phil, you want to take a pulse of, of kind of what side of the, what side of the slide people are on? Yeah, I'd like to ask everybody, if you wouldn't mind, use your chat feature, right? And thinking about your company or, or a typical manufacturing company, tell us if you feel that you're less structured or you feel that you're well structured. So just type in the word less or type in the word well um, that represents your company. Okay, so we're getting a little bit of little bit of both, less structured, well structured. Some are 50 50. Um, some are uh, depending on uh, department. Um, would somebody want to give a, a comment? Ken, do you mind commenting on your position? You had 50 50. You'll have to unmute. Yeah, I was working on it. Sorry, I had a mouthful as well. So <laughs> I feel that. like we've got a lot of structure in the organization. Um, yet I still feel that there are areas that, um, like the new initiatives, we try to kick some things off and they just tend to fizzle out. Good, yeah. Um, the regular meeting with the managers uh, and their direct reports is happening throughout parts of the company, but not consistently through all. So I think we're kind of heading in that right direction, but we're just not there yet. Cool, great, thank you very much. I appreciate your honesty. Sure. Um, how about somebody else? Could we, how about uh, Rick, would you mind, Rick Rundy, would you mind commenting? You were also kind of 50-50. Uh, sure. Yeah, we've got a couple things driving that. One is that, uh, you know, we feel well structured today and then uh, our scale makes us feel less structured tomorrow, if that makes sense. So, you know, as we're growing and expanding and adding people to the team or changing roles on the team, uh, you know, when those changes occur, it feels like we go back to less structured and then we have to re-implement things to get well structured again. So that's that's the back and forth is a little bit. And then we had also... Uh, uh, brought on a new um, uh, subsidiary uh, just before COVID, actually, perfect timing, uh, in another state, uh, which made it difficult to travel to that company. So implementing culture and systems and processes and getting buy-in from that team, doing it remotely through a screen in a virtual meeting has proven to be challenging. So uh, that's, that's the second part of the less structured. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for your input. Yeah, it's uh, I guess it, it's proof that a business operating system needs to be flexible as well. As you're growing and changing, then you need to revisit it uh, throughout its life cycle. Good. Go yeah, ahead, so that's, yeah, so that's, that's exactly what was entering my mind, right? To, to Rick's point, right? Which, what you put in today may have to morph as, you, right? As, you know, for tomorrow, right? The same reason what worked for a business as, that was, that was 5 million doesn't work for businesses that is 10, right? And 
like as Rick said, you know, you ha you have to change those processes. And you know, Ken, it sounds like you've got some good structure in place, but like anything, right? Some people are stronger using the tools. Some people are not as strong, and you've got to you, you know you've got to bring them along. But if you've got the tools to use, you're going to be farther ahead of the game, right? And that's what and that's what we're going to be talking about today is some of those tools and processes. So, so Phil, you brought up, you know, the key point, which is, right, we're not going to be talking about implementing a system like Danaher or like Toyota, right? We're, what we're really talking about today is kind of right-sizing that business for some of the clients that we're dealing with. And I, I've kind of taken the approach of kind of breaking it down into three elements, which, which are, in my mind, people, process, and cadence, people, process, and cadence, because you know, to me, that's what kind of the operating system we're going to be talking about, we're, we're going to be talking about here. And, you know, there's a lot of different operating systems out there. And, and there's a ton that are even, you know, out there for small businesses. You, you, you may have heard of EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System, or the Rockefeller Habits, or, or Covey's Four Disciplines of Execution, or OKRs. And to me, they're all the same, right? They're all the same. And, and they're all around these three core principles. And, and those are people, process, cadence, people, process, cadence, right? People, do people understand their roles in the business? Process, right? Do we have processes that we use to manage those businesses, to manage the, uh, the business? And cadence is nothing more than doing what you say you're going to do. And you need to have that cadence, the right processes and cadence to sustain, right? You need to have the right process and cadence to sustain. So let, let's dive into these and talk a, talk a little bit about them. We're going to start, obviously, with, with people. And Phil's going to kind of take the pulse again of, uh, of the group. Yeah, so I appreciate everybody. If you could use your, uh, the, the reaction feature, the raise your hand feature, and just let us know, do some of your employees, especially key individuals, do they struggle with performance? and accountability, raise your hand. Good. Well, let me ask, Katie, I saw you raise your hand. Can you can you comment a little bit on that? The kind of the frustration you're running into. There you go. Hello, Hello. I did it. Um, I think that there's some roles have shifted and people have risen up and are able to take more accountability and have been doing well. Um, and then others who need more structure, I think, have kind of dived down a little bit. Okay, good. How about, uh, I saw A.T. Wall. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I saw you had your hand up as well. Philip, <laughs> thank you, Aaron. Philip at AT Wall, do you, do you did you have a can you make a comment or would like to? You're on mute. Hi, this is Phil Soares with AT Wall. Um, yeah, basically we struggle with performance and accountability here for uh, various employees um, along the same uh, vein. Yeah, so um, I find that it's uh, it's tough to get people to come up with the metrics that they need so that we can monitor these sort of things and also take accountability for each and every process involved in their, uh, their job, so. Good, good, no, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Don? Good, so, you know, a lot of um, kind of breaking it down, you know, breaking it down into kind of a playbook here of, of, of processes in order from a, from a people standpoint 
is really, you know, how do you get people to understand their roles in the business and, and from an ongoing standpoint, sustain it? And I think to me, it's, there's three buckets of work. And the first thing is talking about it. Um, and you say, well, talking about it, Don, what do you mean by talking about it, right? In my role, helping clients around strategy, right? Strategic planning, executive coaching, things like operating systems, right? You come into business and you start saying what's going on in your business, right? And, and a lot of times it leads to frustrations with people. And, you know, when we're talking about people, I'll say, well, let me ask you a tough question. When you talk to them about this issue, what do they say? And I'll tell you, more than 50% of the time, I kind of, I, the answer I get is, well, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking with them soon on this because they haven't talked to them about it, right? And you say to yourself, boy, what's wrong with that picture, right? You're, you're talking about frustrations with maybe an individual or department, but yet you haven't had a conversation about it. Why? Well, oh, those conversations are hard. Uh, they are hard, right? It doesn't mean we can't have them, but too many folks, too many folks just aren't having that conversation. But it's, it's really the first step, right? It's, the first step is having that candid conversation about what's going well, right? Giving, getting feedback from the employee on what's going on, um, right? Before you can move forward, you have to have that frank conversation with the employee about, you know, what's going well and what's not going well and, uh, and getting in sync with that employee. You know, the next step, right? The next step is really documenting it and, and getting really clearly on the same page. Um, and, and, you know, this is something probably until about 10 years ago, I, I almost poo-pooed myself. Like, well, they should know what to do, right? Why do I really need the job description? Is it really that important? Well, you know, it, it is important. It really is important because, you know, what are the four or five core things that you're really... You're, that's really important in their job. And what does really success look like, right? Um, you know, Phil, you mentioned about the metrics. Uh, you know, there's a kind of, you're looking at a template here for a, a key job description, but right, the heart of it is the duties and responsibilities. Um, one of the things to, to your point, Phil, is when I start talking with clients about doing job descriptions, I also urge them to kind of not just list, list the duties and responsibilities, but list what does success look like for, for those, you know, for some of the key elements. Because, you know, sometimes some people's minds, right? You, you've all had this, right? People are shocked that you're frustrated with their performance because their expectation of what success looks like is different than yours. And that's where you need to get on the same page, right? So for example, this was for an inside sales manager, right? Yeah, duties and responsibilities. Complete quotes for the outside sales team. New customers and new accounts. Yeah, well, what does success look like? Success looks like completing those quotes accurately and within 24 hours, right? To Phil's point, right? It's, it's, you're, you're putting some metrics around that that really adds clarity around what success looks like you know, for that individual. So, and Don, Don, I was going to say the people that have worked with me, uh, you'll hear me often say that you need a tool that helps create a strong agreement between the two parties, right? And this document is very clear and you have strong agreement. Yeah, you know, and we need, you know, I'm not going to touch on that, but especially if you've got new employees, right? Uh, hopefully you've got an onboarding plan for them that really helps them be successful, put some structure around, you know, their first month or two in the business. But boy, what better thing to do in the first week if you haven't had, if you don't have one, or maybe you revisit the job description. So there's tons of clarity around job, job you know, the job description, duties and responsibilities, as well as, you know, what success looks like, you know, especially in the first 30, 60, 90 days. So really, really, really important stuff. And, you know, the next thing is sustainability, right? It's always the most difficult thing in business, right? Well, how do you, how do you sustain keeping people on the right track, right? How do you sustain kind of staying in sync with your employees? And that, 
And those typically are one-on-one -on -one meetings, right? You, you find them in a lot of larger organizations. They're part of standard work. I've heard, I heard, uh, you know, somebody was talking earlier about, uh, you know, having one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and let's face it, even when you're in an organization that has them, certain managers have them, certain managers need a nudge to make sure they're having them. You know, it's part of managing your team, but you know, what those, what those one-on-one -on -one meetings do is it really keeps you in sync, you know, with your, with your direct report. Um, I like to use the analogy, you know, sometimes people, they're kind of like, uh, like trains, right? Sometimes, sometimes people get off track, just like a, just like a model train. Well, guess what? They, model trains, ne those trains never jump on back on track themselves, right? You need to help that person get them back on track keep them on track. That's what one-on-one -on -one meetings do. Right? Well, when you say one-on-one -on -one meetings, Don, what, what are you talking about? Well, you know, it, first of all, they're not just project updates, right? But what they're doing is they're keeping you, they're keeping you in sync and on track with that employee, right? You're discussing any specifics of what's going on, right? You're able to give them feedback and coaching. Sure, you can dive into projects, but they're not just a project update because you know if you think about it right what gets frustrating with even on the employee side is if they're not having those conversations or you, you know they're having some level of stress in their in, in the business right you want to make sure you're addressing it and talking about it and you know we all have different levels of employees at our company right we've got a com companies we we would put into the A bucket, maybe the C bucket, and hopefully not too many in the C and D bucket. But which employees are more valuable? Which employees are more marketable? Your A's or your C's? Wh which employees are you most concerned about? Right, your A's or your B's and C's? You're, you're concerned about your A's, right? Nothing's worse than having an an employee leave the business after you've invested a couple of years at them because of some frustration that they're not sharing. You know, these one-on-one -on -one meetings are a way of making sure we're sharing and you're staying in, you know, in sync with that employee. Hey, Don, do you mind if I add a comment here? Um, I, I just want to reinforce what Don is saying here is that the one-on-one the -on -one meeting um, should be effective. It's not one or the other. You either, it's not you just sitting there listening to the employee. Um, and it shouldn't be just you telling the employee and reviewing projects, you know, bing, bing, bing. It should be a little bit of both because you're trying to learn from them as well. And I'll hear people say, I'll ask, do you have regular one on ones? And they're like, no, all they do is bitch and complain. Well, that's a red flag, right? If they're all they're doing is complaining, they're, you need to get to the, get to the bottom of that and understand why and stop that because when they're not sitting in a room with you, they're out on your production floor complaining as well. And that's just impacting everybody's morale. But, you know, you want to control the one-on-one. -on -one. You want to make sure that it's effective and the time is well used. Right. So. I, yeah. And it's, it's exactly, and that, and that exactly points to the agenda and the template. And by the way, this is actually one of the takeaways you'll get. Uh, Aaron will be sending out a one-on-one -on -one template to you a couple of days after the webinar. But, you know, the first couple of points go exactly what Phil's talking about, right? You know, you know, you start out with what's going on. How's it going? What's, you know, what, what's on your agenda, right? What do you want to talk about? Uh, how's the team going? You know, we all know folks have, there's all, inter, you know, right? People, we're, we're running a company with people there, you know, there's interpersonal relationships. Some are going well, some are challenging. It's, it's a time to talk about those, right? Talk about those frustrations like Bill was talking about, uh, you know, share things that are going on with, in the company, uh, right? You know, you, you don't start a one-on-one -on -one meeting just jumping into coaching and feedback, right? You want to make sure you're developing that rapport. And if people have uh, topics that they want to talk about, they're frustrated, you know, it's to Phil's point, it's your responsibility to talk about them. It's your responsibility to talk about them at the next meeting too, right? Don't just listen, right? You, you owe them some feedback on that. Uh, you know, yeah, and if, the, they, if they tell you they've got a problem, it's your job to help them solve that problem. And when you solve these problems that they bring to you, all you're doing is building trust between you and that employee and improving that relationship. 
Yeah, exa exactly. Right. But what, what is this doing? Right. It's keeping you. I like to use the word in sync again. Right. It's it's keeping you in sync with your employees. And, you know, you're 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 you know, you're a you're a talent. The people that you're investing in and want to have in the future, you know, even more important to do this. You know, I tell people you should be doing it monthly, you know, depending on your organization. Uh, you know, does everyone need to be done? Have, uh, you know, do these monthly? No. Uh, you know, maybe if somebody's struggling, it, it, it's every couple of weeks, every two or three weeks. But, uh, you know, for some of the folks, it can be every, uh, you know, every two months, but it, it needs to be part of your playbook. So the, the next, the next question, the next part is, is uh, kind of process here that we'll dive into. And again, uh, Phil, you want to take the kind of pulse of the of the group here? Yeah, no, thanks, Don. Again, um, I'd like you guys to use your raise your hand feature, if you don't mind, um, and answer this question. Do we, do we struggle with communication and coordination between people and departments? Good. Awesome, great. Hey, Frank, would you mind uh, uh, taking you off, taking yourself off a of mute, and do you mind talking to this one for a, for a second? Frank, do you mind taking yourself off mute and just making a quick comment regarding the communication and coordination between people and departments. Bill Frank has published in the chat that he can't come off mute. Oh, I don't have that up as well. All right, how about, Ken, do you want to talk about this one real quick? I see you've got your hand up. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, we just find communication is probably the root cause of every issue that we have around here. And it's just, you know, whether it's people not including the right departments when they're making decisions, or, you know, they're just leaving people out, whether it's due to personalities or whatnot. Um, there always seems to be some level of uh, struggle, um, not only interdepartmentally, but intradepartmentally. All right. Greg, how about you? Would you mind commenting? Sure. Um... I just started here a few weeks ago, but the first comments out of everybody, everybody I've met so far is um, we work in silos. We don't communicate. So obviously we've got a problem. Well, that's a challenge. That is a challenge. Don, you have a comment on that? Don, go ahead. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was Don or John. But no, back, I mean, right. I mean, every company, right? It's a common theme where we talk about it. But I, I would argue that, that from a CI term, right? From a standard work, we need to make sure we're putting in processes, right? We're putting in processes that drive that communication. And, uh, you know, those, those processes kind of help us manage our business, right? Uh, those processes kind of fall into buckets of kind of daily, weekly, and, uh, and monthly processes. So when we when we talk about processes, right? When we talk about daily processes, you know, I, I like to use the term, uh, you know, especially for uh, you know from a production standpoint of of using you know daily management, visual management, or communication boards, right? That really start to 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 talk to some of the issues that that, that folks jumped in on. So a couple examples, right? I mean, for a lot of a lot of organizations, um, SKU dip boards are these are kind of the, the gold standard, right? In Danaher, you went to every production factory in every department around the world, and you saw the same the same concept of boards. They were all a little different, but it was about safety, quality, delivery, inventory, and productivity, right? You'll hear the acronym SKU dip. You hear them called Gemba walks, daily huddles, but it's about again, it's about keeping people aligned and and talking about how we're doing yesterday and what we're doing tomorrow. Um, 
you know, they're really, they're not eye candy. They are not eye candy. You know, it is a management tool. And the reason it's called daily management is management's a verb in this case. It's not just, uh, you know, it is not just uh, eye candy on, on, uh, on how we're doing. You know, different kind of folks have different scheduling boards. Uh, this was an example of a, of a team that had uh, four water jet machines new production, a new operations manager I was coaching. You know, your first and second shift guys aren't talking. The second shift guys are at night with, with no support. They're not, they're saying the material's not there. They can't find the programs. The maintenance guy's not communicating with the supervisors and they're all coming to him, right? Lack of communication. We set up a simple board that the first and second shift got in front of. At the top left, what are we running right now? Who's the customer? right? Everybody can, see, everybody can see that. In the center there, you can see next job up. It talked about what's, what's the next job up. They actually refined this and add in, added in some more detail to make sure that the raw material was queued and the, and, and the program was also ready. Got rid of the problems they were having with second shift, not having the programs ready. Also, the maintenance guy came to this meeting. He was communicating on if the machine if the machine was down, is it going to be back up by noon tomorrow or noon next week? Are there some PMs that are scheduled, right? Five minutes in front of this board and before first shift and between first and second shift, it got folks talking. It got folks communicating in a very visual way. People could look at this board and see what was going on. You know, they're really, really powerful front end of a business. This was actually a, uh, a custom crane manufacturer, small business, five, six million dollars, you know, you know, custom jobs, custom engineered, get the PO, send the submittal, get the submittal out, order the material, a lot of moving parts, right? They really weren't talking. They came up with a simple board. They got in front of it twice a week got in front of it twice a week. Everybody could communicate on each of the jobs. Where are they? Is that job out for submittal? Did the customer sign? What's the current timeline? Did the timeline change? Everybody got in front of it for about 15 minutes, twice a week, kept everyone aligned, right? Kept everyone aligned. Uh, you know, to me, the, the, the daily management, visual management, it is kind of the single most powerful tool, right? Of, of kind of communication it can be customized for any business and it's actually more important. It's more important for the job shops than it is for the, uh, you know, the, the standard, uh, the standard widget business. Cause I, I kind of get that, right. Oh, we're different. We're, we're a job shop. Well, it's more important for job shops than it is for, uh, than it is for any other kind of a business. Well, Don, and I like your examples, how they're all different. There is no one way to do it. It's got to be, customized for your business and it's got to be effective and work for your company. Yeah, we used it for production. You know, in my, in my last role, we had ones in the purchasing and procurement department every day talking about some of the procurement and, and, and purchasing KPIs. Engineering, we did twice a week, right? We, they all got tailored a little differently uh, depending on the department. You know, from a, from a weekly, from a weekly standpoint, uh, you know, in, in, in certain businesses, whether it's once a week or, 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 or once a month, you know, you need to tailor these. But again, right, they need to be effective to make sure you're really communicating, uh, you know, whether it's engineering or sales and sales and production updates, uh, you know, key business updates. Right. If 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 you don't have a process to pull people together, um, you know, they're going to be they're going to be out of sync and they're going to be frustrated with lack of communication. Uh, I was working with a small job shop, uh, you know, small, a lot of people wearing different hats, three different people that were doing the quotations. They were all doing them differently. They were all using a different system to track them. His business was really suffering with incoming orders, but yet were they getting together at all really to talk about kind of the state of the business and quotations and incoming order books? You know, they were not right. They were not. So what we did was we put in place, you know, let's let's just get together and uh, every two weeks talk about our order book, open quotes, who's following up on what. Right. That that kind of that is a process that that really starts to drive communication and you can put some metrics around that. 
you know, and, and typically on a monthly basis, you know, the, if you, if are you, are you, do you have some KPIs on your business? Are you talking about uh, what are the root cause corrective actions? Are people plugged into the, from a financial standpoint, you know, and for small businesses, I think you can find a level of financial reporting that you're comfortable with, right? It doesn't have to drive down to the net profit level. If you're not comfortable with that, you can stay at the gross margin level, uh, you know, and, but find a level of financial reporting to make sure people really understand the state of the business. You know, you know, are you using some strategic, do you have a couple of strategic initiatives that you're driving? You know, once a month, are you talking about those? Are you working on those? Are you, are you kind of keeping the, the group uh, aligned? Kind of another, you know, another tool, especially a lot of the companies uh, that have implemented some business operating, you know, a business system is, is having a bowler, right? A key, a KPI, a key performance indicator bowler. Let's, let's, keep, let's keep in front of this the metrics that are important to us. So you can see, you know, in this one, it's safety, quality, delivery, and some financial metrics. What's, what's our plan? What's our actual? How are we doing, right? What's our scorecard? You know, it's very easy to keep this in front of us on a monthly basis to see how we're doing on some of those key indicators. Again, you're, you're keeping people aligned. Uh, you know, this is something that the, the management team can look at once a, once a week, excuse me, once a month. And, it's, and, and you can take elements of this elements of this that make sense, use it for your all employee meetings. Are you going to have those once a month? You probably not. Should you be having them at least once a quarter to fill, fill everyone in on, on how the business is doing? Yeah, you probably should be using them once a quarter. You know, use, use some of the same, um, same tools that you're using for your management team. You know, pick the ones out that are important to communicate to all your employees. And the last element is really cadence. And I guess Phil, kind of final final question for the today is uh, about sustainability. Yeah. So the last question, and again, I'd like you guys to use your raise your hand feature. Are are initiatives that you've started to improve your business? Are you are they sustained, or do they do you see that fallback? Do things tend to just fall back to the way they were? Raise your hand if you if you see that they are they are being sustained or you have an impact here. Rick Grundy, do you mind making a comment on this one? I saw you have your hand up. Uh yeah, sure. I think the uh, the general feel is similar to what I shared before, where uh, the results are mixed depending on the audience. I think on, on one side of our business where we've got more history and, and uh, more experience and more uh, of a track record uh, for what we're doing, those messages are received, heard, and executed, and, and we sustain those without needing a lot of help. On, on the other side of the business, there are those where uh, I, I believe the initiatives are sustained, uh, but I shouldn't have to be there with the gas can pouring fire on it every so often, like to keep those initiatives burning. They're sustained, but I don't think the way they're being sustained is sustainable. Yeah, it's brute force. That's right. Yeah. Ken, did you want to make a comment? Ken Berker? <laughs> sure. So uh, not much different than uh, Rick. There's a lot of things that we have put in place over the years that uh, we are sustaining, even some uh, new things that Claire has helped us with uh, in Lean as certainly uh, we are sustaining those changes. Uh, however, um, just as Rick said, there are many times I find that for myself, um, I've got to continually nag people to make sure they uh, stay on task with some of these efforts. Okay. Well, good. Yeah, I know a lot of the companies that I talk to that they they experience that fallback effect. You know, they try a new initiative, it's going for a while, and then 
over time, if somebody like yourself isn't staying on top of it and hammering people, it slowly falls back to the way it was. And there's Good. also the fact that, you know, we, you know, you think you've got something and it seems to be gaining momentum and then something changes and it doesn't necessarily make any sense anymore. So you just, you let it, you let it slip away. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Good. All right, Don. Yeah. And to, you know, to Ken and Rick, right. I mean, Ken, especially with, uh, you know, you use the example of a lot of folks that implement lean tools, uh, struggle, right? A lot of folks implement when, when you're going down a kind of a lean roadmap, right? What, what's one of the foundations of lean? Well, when you're going, you know, your foundations of lean, you start with, you start with 5S, you start with standard work, right? You start with one piece flow, but something as simple as, as 5S can be really hard to sustain, right? What is a process that helps people sustain 5S? A process to help people sustain 5S is doing daily management and having a 5S audit sheet that, get, that happens every day where people are auditing the area for 5S, right? That is a process that helps you sustain uh, versus the brute force of, of nagging people about you know, why they can't do the area or why it's not clean. Well, look, if someone understands from a people standpoint, their responsibility is to do that audit and you've communicated that, right? It's a process that, that's put in place. The cadence for that is that we're doing daily management every day and we're making sure the audit sheet is filled out, right? And, that, and that's what drives sustainability. So to me, that's an example where you can put processes around these initiatives and with the right cadence, it really helps with the, with the sustainability of them. It really helps with the sustainability of them. So, you know, the, the cadence, the cadence is nothing more than, than sticking to the plan, right? It's nothing more than doing what you said you were going to do on your processes, right? Because if you, if you set up processes and you don't stick to them, and I know it's hard, right? I know it's hard. Uh, either something's happened, either they have the wrong content, you know, or, or the, uh, or they're not being managed properly, right? One or the other, and and you need to you need to get into the detail of uh, of what's going on there to uh, to make a correction, right? If if it's not adding value, change the content. Uh, but you know the uh, the core of this is that right cadence and sticking to the processes is uh, you know it's there's no use setting up those processes if you're not going to uh, if you're not going to sustain them. So when you pull back and you, and you think about people process cadence, right? We talked about people understanding their, their role in the business, right? It, it, there needs to be open communication about that. There needs to be accountability for that. And, it, and it's performance management, right? It's up, to, it's up to us as the leaders in the business and the, and the management team to, to hold folks accountable. And if you're doing, if you have clear job descriptions, you're talking about their roles, and you're having one-on-one -on -one meetings, right? It will it will keep it will keep them on track, right? If you've got those processes in place, those standard processes that add structure and discipline and 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 driving communication between departments and managing the business, uh, right? It it goes a long way to make sure you're uh, you're managing the business properly. And again, the cadence is nothing more than uh, than sticking to the. Uh, Right, sticking to those processes we uh, we put in place. Good. So, so maybe just kind of general questions from the group. Maybe what resonated to you, what did not. Uh, Phil, you want to que query the uh, query the yeah, attendees no, just, on any questions? I was going to do what you just did. Does anyone have any questions regarding business operating systems for for Don? So Phil and Don, this is Aaron. Really great stuff that you guys have shared here. I've had a couple of questions that have come in directly to me. And do you mind if I toss one of those at you guys? Would that no, be all right? Okay, great. One so one of the questions was about the meetings. Um, and it was, it's a team of five at my machine shop. Do we really need daily meetings? 
right? So of course the answer is it depends, right? It depends, right? I mean, if you've got, uh, you know, the answer is it depends, right? I mean, if it, if it depends on, you know, if you've got short runs, I, I would answer the, the, real, the real question is, right? What are the problems you're having? What's the lack of coordination? What are the stumbling blocks, right? If, if, if everything's running fine and you guys have good processes in place to communicate about orders, what's up next, making sure materials here, uh, no, no quality issues, right? No safety issues, right? Things are running smooth. Well, yeah, maybe a weekly production stand up is fine, but if there's a, the more moving parts there are and the more lack of coordination there is, uh, Right. That's what's going to drive you to structure daily processes around. Uh, right. Around your yeah. team. I mean, I mean, in my, in my last role, right, we had a large plant. Um, you know, we had seven different seven different really value streams or product lines in that plant. We rotated the whole plant every day, five minutes at each at each five to seven minutes at really each, uh, you know, each value stream. Um, to talk about safety, quality, delivery, you know, product, productivity. Um, I think I'm taking two things from what you're saying, Don, which I think are really important. One, it's just a meeting doesn't have to be a 50 minute slog. It can be no. a five minute. And also, and I think this maybe builds a little bit on, on what Rick was pointing out earlier, you know, times change. And sometimes you might need more frequent meetings because you've just completed an acquisition or you're going through a pandemic or there's a, a major issue that needs to be taken care of. In which case you want your system to be flexible enough to accommodate more meetings at sometimes, fewer at others. Is that correct? And yeah, I also have to be careful too, because I don't want to come across like we're trying to set up, you know, 15 meetings. I mean, <laughs> the last the last company I worked with was a distributor. Uh, we ended up coming up with a structure, you know, he didn't really have manufacturing, he didn't really need daily huddles, but we ended up coming up with two structured meetings a month with a defined agenda where at you know where where they had specific things they talked about in the two meetings uh, that he had during the month that that was right for him right that w- that was right for him by the flip side i've had other clients where say oh we talk all the time we don't need meetings we were working on a strategic initiative on hiring a new uh, northeast salesman and every 6 weeks i would go in there for strategy and we talk about hiring the new six- new salesman and he, yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Nine months later, the sales guy actually talked about the fact, I'm not sure if we really want a new sales guy. Wow. So in a way they were out of, they, you know, they were out of a line for nine months and they kept having a strategy meeting saying, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. But in the reality, they really were not on the same page, right? Like, yeah. boy, how, frust- how frustrating is that? Frustrating and relatable. Um, Phil and Don, I believe Katie has her hand raised. Oh, good. Um, I was just wondering, since you're on the topic of daily meetings and the importance of it, um, I think our company, the importance of the daily meetings is really good for getting everybody in the same place. Mm-hmm. But we often find that the conversations happen when the meeting's over, after everyone's going going back to their spot. Um, And I was just wondering if you had anything to kind of speak on for the meeting being something where everyone can speak together instead of just like one or two managers giving a speech to the floor and then everyone talking amongst themselves afterwards. Yeah. So, you know, Katie, when I do this, I tell people that the boards and how the board gets set up is only about 20% of effectiveness in, in the use of daily management, right? 80% of it comes to be how it's managed, right? So you need to, whoever's leading it, the leader needs to set the expectation on, you know, the behaviors and what they want to should be talking about the fact that they should be talking about issues openly And that's why we're here. Um, I'll give you the example. I talked about the last plant. Uh, It was not a Danaher plant. I came from Danaher, went to this plant. I took six weeks to run, to set up the first one for the first apartment and had different people there and the different leaders there for six weeks to run that daily management meeting. 
Why? Because I wanted to make sure they understood how the meeting should be run, what we were expecting out of those meetings to exactly your point. They're there to make sure people are talking. If they have concerns, bring them up, uh, not to hide issues and, and be forthright with each other and kind of holding each other accountable. That's why they're there. So the the short answer is that you really have to set the expectations and you have to really un and, and set the expectations on the content of the meetings and the kind of behaviors you want out of the people. Thank you. Good answer. Hey, Don, I, I kind of have a question too for you is uh, a lot of the companies that we work with are small. They have older employees that have been around for a long time yet they're still struggling to, to grow. Does it still make sense to, to, to do a detailed job description for, for employees that have been around for a long time and supposedly know what their job role is? Yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, whenever I work with companies, we never start out saying, we're gonna do the job descriptions for everybody in the company. We never do that, right? What we do is we say, it's, it's kind of like this next slide here, right? What we do is we say, where are the pain points in the company, right? So when we, when we start to work with people, we say, Let, let's talk about where you're struggling or where you're having problems with some individuals. We focus on the job descriptions there first. Uh, we don't say across the board, we're going to do an initiative and get them all done in three months, right? We're going to focus on where the pain points are. Same thing on process, right? We're going to focus on process where we're struggling maybe with interdepartmental communication or, you know, uh, or maybe a, a sales and marketing organization or maybe a production organization. We focus on process there, get it in, get it sustaining, and then build on it from there. So, mm -hmm. you know, w would I argue that job descriptions are good? Would I, would I say that, that, that that's the, f the first thing we need to do is work on a job description for a long-term employee? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus there. And, you know, I, I certainly would be okay if we, uh, if we didn't even, uh, if we didn't even, if we didn't even work on that, Phil, for an employee that was really high performing and knew that he was uh, maybe even at the end of his tenure, right? Yeah, no, I agree on a high performing. And, uh, but I, it's, I think you mentioned that uh, sometimes what the employee thinks are their expectations versus the supervisor uh, can be different. Even for somebody who's been around a long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, if, if you and if you're not on the same page, right, that's that's exactly where it comes in. It, it comes into play. And All where right. it can add, and where it can add value. Don, I just noticed we are right at our time. I don't want to hold anybody over. Um, I think you've, you've, there's a, you've got an example here of, a, of a kind of an engagement roadmap that you were just talking to. And uh, um, I want to thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and coming here and presenting uh, for us. Uh, I think it's been a great discussion. Um, everybody, check your email. We will send out kind of a follow-up toolkit to this presentation. Uh, it'll come out from Aaron. We'll have the one-on-one -on -one templates in there and kind of the sustaining performance and the key indicator chart. But uh, again, thank you everyone for your participation. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Okay. Thanks all.